Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 25 of Chris's Creative Corner of the first season. I'm excited you are here, and I'm sure you are anxious and dying to know what in the world is going on with Casey. Um, I realized that the last episode ended on a cliffhanger, and I was kind of taken aback by how emotional I got about it, and I, I fucking wrote the thing. And I'm just like, oh my god, this is horrible. Like, I feel terrible for putting people through this. I Like, I'm going through it with you all, and I'm just like, ah, uh, why? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read first, get into the chapter first, and then I'm going to do questions for Chris after, which I think is only fair. Um, for anyone, for anyone who didn't um, tune in last week or this is your first time, you should probably go back and um, um, watch or listen to a few episodes because we are at the point where Nick um, has just learned that his best friend Casey has overdosed on some type of drug or and or alcohol so um overdosing is hard i want to make sure to include links um to substance abuse and mental health help um those are all in the description um please make sure to check those out if you or you know someone who needs the help um that's absolutely what they're there for i realized that i wrote this and i realize also that it's important that the story is told no matter how hard it is to tell it because <clears throat> Because a lot of queer people who go through um, coming out trauma and things like that go through a lot of things before they are able to accept themselves and love themselves for who they are and find that community of acceptance as well. So this is really important and I am getting into it now, into the chapter. I would like to say that there is a trigger warning in effect for this chapter um, especially when it comes to talk of suicidal ideation. Chapter 25. The Word. I sat in the hospital for three days while Casey slept. Or detoxed, I guess. The doctor said he had overdosed on a mix of Oxycontin and Adderall. Combined with the drinking, they'd had to pump his stomach and keep him sedated for his own good. He'd woken up and had clawed a nurse in the face. Then they restrained him. He was pale and sweaty. I kept re-wetting a washcloth to dab at his face. Kennedy and Levi were frequently there, too. They'd brought flowers and balloons and his guitar. Just in case. They wanted him to be surrounded by the things he was comforted by. Omar had managed to get out ahead of everything. He said Casey was suffering from the flu and had been working hard on the next record, but we're all going to make sure he's in perfect health before continuing. To us, he told us we needed to bring in another bass player to finish the songs. We only had four more to go. No, Omar. We're not replacing Casey. He's our bass player. We need to get the album done, Nick. I shook my head. I'm not singing in this band with someone else playing the bass. If you want to finish the album, find a new lead singer. Omar looked like he wanted to object, but as I sat defiantly by Casey's bedside, he knew it was no use. He threw his hands in the air and left. Veruca stopped by the day after he'd been admitted. Did you know he was sick? She gave a wry smile. I knew he had an addiction problem. I grew up with addicts. He had all the signs. And he'd tell me he was fine after drinking a whole bottle of wine by himself, but he'd also been taking drinks from his flask. She was definitely smarter than she let on. We're done, I think. I told my agent I'll stick it out through this fake flu, but I'm done. It's obvious he doesn't like me. He likes you just fine. It was just for publicity, I thought. She raised her eyebrows. It was supposed to be you, you know. I frowned. What was supposed to be me? My agent originally wanted to set me up with you, but your guy, Omar, said you were off limits. He's a really good manager. Other managers would make you try to hide who you are. He lets you embrace it. But Casey said he'd requested to be set up for publicity. She laughed and stood. 
Yeah, well, I'm not surprised he lied to you. He does that a lot, but not as much as he lies to himself. She walked over to him and delicately planted a kiss on his forehead. Get better, Casey. For yourself, not for anyone else. After three days, they finally lifted the sedation slightly and he was allowed to wake up. He immediately pulled on the straps, but gave up when he saw me. I was standing ready with a glass of water and a straw. Hey, Nick. His voice was scratchy. Hey, I have some water. I lowered the glass down and he sucked some down. He laughed. You have anything stronger? I just looked at him. Kidding. So... So... Casey looked around the room. Gifts from my admirers? Yeah, and your admirers are your bandmates, and Veruca, and Omar. He looked at me, vulnerable in his hospital gown and paleness. Nick, I don't really remember everything. What happened at the Grammys? We don't really have to talk about it. We could just... No. He gave me a serious look and nodded his head to the restraints on his arms. What the fuck happened? How did I get like this? I sighed and put my hands to my face, rubbing my forehead. Casey, you overdosed. He took in a deep breath, nodding. That's what I was afraid of. Shit. Well, I guess I can't hide anything now. It's not like you were hiding it before. We all knew what you were doing, Casey. He frowned. Then why didn't you say anything? What, have another talk like the one in the hotel room about your drinking? Was it good for you? He let out a noise of protest. It's just... His eyes started to water, and then the tears started to fall. Shit. I really messed up. I remember getting up on stage. Did we win? I blinked back my own tears. Yeah, Casey, we won six Grammys. We're up there with Adele, Kendrick Lamar, and Amy Winehouse. We were so big, I can't even think about it. We won them all? The big four? I nodded. Yeah. I made sure to thank your parents, because without them giving us their garage to rehearse in, we wouldn't have made it anywhere. And I even got a dig in at my dad. I thanked my mom for loving me for who I was, and I thanked my dad for reminding me family can be just as much of an obstacle to overcome as any life adversity. He laughed a little. I wish... I wish I could have been there to see that. The audience really loved it. I could see a few people's faces going like, ooh, sick burn. I could also see other people didn't appreciate it, but fuck them, you know? What about the rest of the awards? I thought back. I mean, it was all kind of a blur. Very surreal. I got lots of compliments on my tux, and a lot of people asked about you. Omar is telling everyone it's the flu, by the way. He sniffed. I'm really sorry I did this to all of you. I shook my head and wiped away his tears since his hands were still tied down. You did it to yourself, Casey. You could have died. I would have been totally and completely alone. The tears poured harder from his blue eyes. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Yes, you do. I stood up, suddenly feeling angry. You're hiding. You can't deal with something you're going through, and so you're hiding behind drugs. You've been hiding since before we got famous. He nodded, frowning. I'm so unhappy, Nick. Don't know why, but I am. I have all these amazing things in my life, and I'm still not happy. Then you should be talking to someone about it. I wiped my nose and grabbed a tissue for Casey. Here, blow. He turned his head away from me. I don't need you to baby me, Nick. I'm not babying. Your hands are tied, and you're starting to drip snot. You know how I feel about snot. Oh. 
I wiped his nose, and we sat in silence for a moment. What are you going to do, Casey? What's your plan from here? He shrugged. I don't have a plan. Well, you need to think of something, because what you've been doing clearly isn't working. Unless you want to kill yourself. You got so close to ending it all, Casey. Is... Do you? I wanted to ask the question, but I also didn't want to hurt him. He frowned. I guess some part of me does. I... I feel like I can't be who I want to be, so I'd rather be dead. Who do you want to be? I want to be myself. I slapped my thighs. Then just be yourself. Change what needs to be changed. I'll be here to support you. We all will. But he trailed off, blinking rapidly. What? If I do what makes me happy, then it will be true. What will be true? A tear fell down his face. If I say it, it makes it true. I looked down and sighed. I've heard somewhere the truth will set you free. But how long do you need to inflict harm on yourself before it does? How many more drinks? How many more pills? How many more overdoses will it take for you to realize what other people think about you doesn't matter? What if my family disowns me like yours did? I felt my stomach twist. Were we talking about something like coming out? My mind raced. What if he was gay? Trans? What if he wanted to live life as a woman? I didn't ask. I wanted to, but I'm sure he wouldn't tell me if I did. I felt like asking him to say exactly what it was wasn't the way to go. He clearly wasn't ready, and I didn't want to push. Casey, I didn't tell you this because I didn't want to get my hopes up, but I had a really good talk with my mom. I think she's going to leave my dad because of how he's been. She's really unhappy with him, and she misses me. And I miss her. It took some time, but I think it's in the very beginning stages of working itself out. And it just took time. Time? I nodded. I think your parents are much more laid back than mine about stuff. In general. I think whatever you tell them, they deal with it, you know? And they wouldn't love you any less. I know I wouldn't, and neither would Levi or Kennedy. He seemed to start a little at the mention of their names. Oh, man. Omar's so mad at me, isn't he? We had to stop recording because of me. Well, technically he was just going to find someone else to play the bass. His eyes were wide. Who did he find? Am, am I done? No, you're not done. I told him he'd have to find a new lead singer if he replaced you, even temporarily. The album's on standby until we get you fixed up. He looked around the room. How can I fix this? What should I do, Nick? I squeezed my eyes tightly and rubbed them. I don't want to tell you what to do, Case. But I think you know what needs to happen for you to get better. He looked at me sadly. I've been thinking the words since I woke up. If I say it, it's going to make it true, isn't it? I nodded. But you would get better. That's the truth. He cleared his throat. Seriously. You said before I need counseling. And I still think you do. Now more than ever. Do you think it will really help? I looked at him thoughtfully. I mean, yes and no. Counseling isn't magic. It's a lot of work. You know what I went through when I first got out of high school, especially when it came to coming to terms with who I was. I mean, I still struggle with what other people think of me. I can't stand the idea there are people out there who don't like me, but I ultimately have tools from counseling that help me clear my thinking. Counseling didn't cure me or whatever. It gave me the tools to be my best self. He laughed a little. Be your best self. I've heard you say that before.
Yeah, well, I try not to say it often since I don't want to sound preachy, but I'm going to get a little preachy right now. I leaned forward and gently rested my hand on his arm. You need two kinds of help. Counseling should be one of them. And the other... The other... The word. I gave his arm a gentle squeeze. The first step in solving any problem is recognizing you have one. Do you have a problem? He swallowed hard and nodded quickly. Say it, Casey. I have an addiction problem. His face screwed up as more tears fell. I rubbed his arm. I'm right here with you, Casey. And you know where you can go to get help with this problem, right? You know where? He met my eyes and gave a sad smile with his lips. The word. You have to say it. I'm right here. He grabbed for my hand, and I held it in mine as he said it. Rehab. And that is the end of chapter 25. I want to point out that there are links in the description to make sure that if you are struggling with something like this, there are places you can go, places you can call, people you can talk to. Um, I want to kind of lighten things up because Casey is recognizing that he has a problem, and that's a huge first step in finding recovery. And there's so much hope, even though he's so sad. He's so sad. There's so much hope coming, and I'm just so excited to finish the book and and get to talk about it with my friend Elise and then my husband Trent. Um, we're going to do two different episodes, and we get to talk with each other. Um, I mean, Trent was around while I was writing this book, and he didn't really get to hear much about it. I kind of kept it close. I wanted him to read it, and he didn't for a long time. And I think it was ultimately because he knew that I was going on an emotional roller coaster with my writing, and he did not want to do that. Um, he is he's he's a he feels very deeply, and so I'm just so grateful for him and my friend Elise who are going to be coming on Chris's Creative Corner in episodes 31 and 32. So I'm very excited about that. Um, moving on to questions for Chris. The first question is, what's the most difficult thing about writing characters of the opposite sex? And I want to say, I want to just go right into it, but I also want to take the moment and be like, there are not two sexes, there are more than two sexes. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear. Um, also... Um, I assume what they're talking about are female characters um, or characters who identify as women. And I I didn't think that I had a problem. I don't have a problem writing female characters. Um, I When I originally wrote um, the sci-fi series um, and I sent it to my aunt, the first book, um, she sent it back and she was like, I don't believe that this character is female. Um, and I was like, oh, she was also like, but I also hear your voice very strongly in it and you're not female. You know, I don't identify as a woman. So that's just what I see and experience. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, maybe that's a thing. Um, I also decided it's really important because there are such incredible women in my life and I want to make sure that um, the characters in my stories are surrounded by incredible women like that, that I include them in stories. In this story, it's a little less. Um, Kennedy is the woman, um, and so is Nick's mom. Um, I know she's kind of been absent throughout most of this, and honestly, it's... Part of it is um, trauma reasons. Um, women go through so much bullshit. Um, and a lot of it 
um, is inflicted by men. I mean, let's be honest. Um, the patriarchy, toxic masculinity, that kind of thing. Um, I know that there are probably men listening to this who are like, well, not all men. And I'm like, okay, let's use the metaphor of a gun. A gun um, can harm um, in the in the hands of someone who wants to do harm. The first thing that you learn in gun training courses um, is that you treat every gun like it's loaded, whether you know that it is or isn't. But how do you know whether a gun's loaded if someone else is holding it? You don't. You don't. So women have to be on guard from all men because they don't know which ones are safe just by looking at them. I'd hope that I come across as a safe man. I know if a woman were to approach me and say something like, there's a guy following me, I'd be like, Suzanne, oh my gosh, it's so good to see you. I'm so excited like that we're getting together right now and going to your place and or going back to my place and we're going to play games and blah, 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 and um, yada, yada, yada. And just like totally fake a relationship with a complete stranger who's a woman to make sure that she's safe. I would absolutely do that. Um, I want to really affirm, I want to really confirm that I am an avid, avid supporter of women's rights because women's rights are human rights. And writing characters who identify as women, I just want to write the most powerful, amazing people that I can think of. And they're not, they're not amazing because they're women. They're women and they're amazing. It's, it, does that make sense? Like that's, that's kind of how I view it. In Avoiding Aiden, um, there's Elise. And Sarah and Shanoa and Ginny and Lillian, and they all have their own little things. They're, I just love that cast so much. Um, the play is different. Um, if anybody knows, I wrote a play um, based on avoiding Aiden, but it turns out that having um, four siblings and their spouses slash significant others plus a cast of like other people, that's a big cast. So I had to cut down the cast in the play. So I had to eliminate some of his siblings. And that was really hard for me to do, um, but I did it. And um, I think the play is still good with two siblings um, instead of four. <clears throat> anyway, I don't find it difficult to write characters who identify as women what i find difficult is the conundrum in my head of um the idea of making a main or lead female character when i'm like why wouldn't i read a woman who writes a female character instead um so often i think there's so many men who write female characters <laughs> Like, so ridiculously. Like, her see-through nightgown was waving behind her as she breasted bouncily down the stairs, her supple yet firm breasts with perfect pointed nipples. Like, just, just ridiculous. Like, no, right? Real people. That's what I'm looking for first, is I want to look at a person. Um, gender identity and um, affectional and sexual orientation matter. And it's not the first thing that I look at when it comes to writing a character. And I don't think it's the first thing that people should look at when it comes to reading a book either. Um, if people who have been reading Porchlight or people started reading Porchlight and they were like, oh, this main character is gay, I'm not going to read this. Okay, if that's the one reason that you're not going to read it, that's on you. And that's actually homophobic, like flat out, I'll just say it. The reason that you don't want to read a gay character is because you find him gay first and foremost. You don't read on and figure out what it is, what else he is. He's struggling with his sexuality. Casey clearly now is struggling with something and is actually sounding ready to talk about it. 
and and sexuality and gender identity and affectional orientation, all these things, they're an important part of what makes queer people queer people and cis people cis people and straight people and all the the many great gifts of diversity. I don't know if that's the right word. All the great many facets of diversity on the sliding scale and the chart um, of it depends um, when it comes to your identity and, and who you identify as. So all, I guess... I guess what I'm saying is I don't find it difficult to write women because I don't write women specifically to write women. I write women who are part of my characters' lives and they are important people and not because they're women. And yet the fact that they're women makes them special. If they were men, they would be a different person. It's it's very complicated, and I just – I hope I'm saying it right. I hope that there's no woman listening to this thinking like, oh my gosh, like he's so ridiculous. I don't want to sit there and define a woman at all, actually. I don't want to sit there and say like, oh, I'm writing this woman, and this is what this woman is, and this is what all women are. No, I'm not doing that, and I don't want to do that, and I don't want to come across as some man who sounds like – I know how to write women. I make mistakes with all of my characters. Reading through this, like, I think it was the conversation with his mother, Nick with his mother. How many times did he look at her? It was like, I looked at my mom. I looked at my mom. I looked at my mom. Like, there were three things all within, like, every other alternating dialogue. And I was like, who wrote this shit? And it was me. <laughs> Maybe me. Um... So it's that kind of, I don't write perfect characters, I don't write perfect books, and I don't ever want to. So, yeah, all of that to say, um, the most difficult thing about writing characters who identify as women is the idea of me getting over myself, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'll go with that. Um, next question. Um, how many hours a day do you write? And the answer is, it depends. Um, sometimes I'll write for five hours a day. Sometimes I'll write for 20 minutes. It really just depends on how much time I have. So there have been some times where I've written for like eight hours a day. And I got so much work done. And then I went back and had to rewrite half of it because I ended up changing my mind. So, you know, it's like I can write, you know, 10,000 words a day, whether they stay or not. That's the question. So it really comes down to what I have available in my schedule. Because I'm not a full-time writer, I have a whole other job and I'm doing school and all of the stuff. So it's crazy to think that I have time to write. I barely have time to sleep. So, yes, that is all um, that I will be answering on Questions for Chris. Again, as we wrap up this episode of Chris's Creative Corner, I want to make it clear that Casey's struggle is not something that I've gone through personally. I haven't been addicted to substances to that extent. And it's important to recognize that there are a lot of queer people who are going through similar things while trying to find who they are. So if there's anything that you are taking away from this story, I hope it's that you recognize that Casey's struggle within himself is because of societal expectations because of what messaging he's been told growing up, because of the things that other people say and do, he would be fine if none of that existed. He would know who he was, and he would be fine. So as a person who exists in society, you, I'm talking to you, please remember that 
if there's any advice that I can give you or any hope that I have for you, it's to remember that queer people see you. Whether you are queer or whether you identify as straight and cisgender, queer people see you and they see your actions and they hear your words. And that defines a lot of things for them and it also affects them. So remember kindness, remember love, remember empathy, and remember not just acceptance or tolerance, especially not tolerance. Remember celebration. Remember happiness. It's really hard in this world, in this day and age, to be like, oh yes, I'm so happy. Find the happiness where you can. Thank you for tuning in to Chris's Creative Corner, um, episode 25. Thank you for tuning in to Chris's Creative Corner, episode 25. Hi, Chew. Use more buddy. Use more buddy. He's getting some pets right now. I'm going to leave now and pet my dog and maybe give him a treat. Maybe. Just maybe. Use more good boy. So I might do those things. Um, thank you for tuning in to Chris's Creative Corner, um, episode 25 of the first season. We will see you next time, and have a great week. <laughs>